going to get into a, what I anticipate being a lively discussion. Uh, so <laughs> what we're going to do now, Clark is going to let us know is when's the brain like the planet? And let me tell you, can you find a more intriguing topic for their title than that, Clark? <laughs> Uh, well, that's right. I may bore you. The important thing is to think of titles that don't bore me. Uh, so uh, I, uh, when I got the invitation and looked at the list, I, I, read, uh, I read, or at least skimmed, uh, as, as we do, uh, a couple of Professor Uttal's books. And uh, uh, they are actually a very impressive presentation of a viewpoint that uh, uh, that was adopted by many uh, early in the 20th century under the force of the revelation of connectionist structures in the brain from Cajal and others. Uh, you can find similar views advocated, of course, not with modern evidence, uh, by Sigmund Freud, by Sigmund Exner, uh, by William James, and by many people influenced by them. In fact, there's an uh, eminent behaviorist early in the 20th century who titled his autobiography, The Autobiography of a Connectionist. The two views naturally go together. Uh, and I don't know anything about brains. Actually, I don't know anything about fMRI. But I know a little bit about the history of science. So I thought I would draw a couple of contrasting examples. And then I want to talk more technically about what we can do with machine learning methods of with fMRI data. Uh, and some of what I'll say is motivated by the example. So I want to get outside the discipline and talk briefly about a couple of cases. Uh, one is climate teleconnections. And the other is uh, the history of chemistry uh, in the 18th and 19th century, just very briefly. So climate teleconnections. One of, the, one of the problems that's rightly raised is, and uh, Professor Uthal isn't the first to raise it, is look, there aren't any natural variables. Yes, the, uh, the fMRI guys have to force the variables to exist. And you just heard a talk about forcing the variables to exist, yes? Uh, well, is that a new thing in science? Sort of, you've got to aggregate a whole bunch of stuff to make variables, they just don't they're not there slapping you in the face. Well, no, it's not. Uh, I trust you all know who Gilbert Walker is and have his picture somewhere near your study. Uh, <laughs> uh, Gilbert Wa Walker was one smart guy. He was an administrator in the Raj in India, British administrator. Thank you, Yorkshire. Uh, and uh, uh, he started looking at why he started wondering why the monsoons occurred. They were critical and why they failed. And he discovered, purely correlationally, that if you took a region of the Western Pacific, actually the Eastern Western Pacific, yeah, there was this enormous correlation between a change in temperature, uh, what we now call El Nino, and the failure of the monsoons. Uh, it's now called uh, the uh, ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, and uh, here's a little diagram of uh, how it works. Uh, actually, the uh, diagram is from Irvine. How about that? Um, uh, now, he literally had, it wasn't as though there's some sort of natural part of the Western Pacific across uh, near near the coast of Chile, yes, that says, oh, pick me, I'm the right variables, yes? He had to kind of aggregate temperatures, uh, and indeed we still do. That's exactly how we do it today, yes? So climate experts have picked out areas where they have measurements now from satellites, they used to be from buoys and ships. They aggregate temperatures and pressure at sea level over those areas, they become variables for climate models. Now, with climate models, you can do things in great detail. Yes, those are the kinds of models you hear about when people are forecasting global warming, etc. Yes? Or you can do things roughly at the level that Gilbert Walker did, except with modern statistical methods 
and with more regions measured. And the climate physicists have pretty much figured out what the relevant regions are, the most relevant ones. So you can actually build from the time series data of measurements of temperature and pressure for the various regions. Uh, you don't even need to know what these are. Uh, for the various reasons, you can actually build a causal model of the process, and you can obviously don't know it's exactly correct, yes? But what you do know is you can go check with the experts, yes? And ask them, well, okay, does the southern oscillation drive the western Pacific? Yes. Does the North Atlantic oscillation, is it an, it an exogenous driver of the uh, Arctic oscillation? Yes. So you can actually check with what people who've worked with this kind of stuff have done uh, for many years. And this is generated from the time series data uh, by methods, some of which I'm going to talk, actually I'm not going to talk about these methods, but basically by machine learning methods. So notice we aren't giving a detailed physical model. If you said, oh, okay, I want to know the whole story about how the climate works, this isn't it. Yes. If you said, OK, I want to know what's going on in this little bit of the Atlantic, no dice, can't tell you. Yes? If you said, I want to know exactly what's going to happen in this month in this region, no, can't tell you. This gives you a qualitative picture. Now, you notice there aren't numbers. It doesn't say, oh, you vary this guy four degrees, this guy measure varies five degrees, or whatever. Actually, this is pressure, so whatever. But it's a qualitative map, and it's not a map. It's a characterization of causal processes. Yeah? So here's a moral about science. Nature doesn't have to hit you in the face with the right variables. Sometimes, by wiggling around and a lot of work with them, you can figure out variables that have a stable structure. Secondly. Just because you can't know everything doesn't mean you can't know anything. Yeah? Well, that's the moral I take from there. Let's take another example, chemistry, the chemical three bears. Um, so one of, uh, one of the uh, 18th century views about, and 19th century views about chemistry was that what you should do is find out which substances combine with what other substances in what proportions by weight. And you make tables of chemical equivalents. And you ask no further about how that comes about. Uh, why shouldn't you ask any further? Because attempts to ask any further go beyond the empirical data. Jean-Marie Dumont, Jean-Baptiste Dumont, excuse me, uh, the leading French chemist in the middle of the 19th century said, uh, I won't put it in French because you would throw things at me, uh, said, if I were master, I would have abolish the word atom from chemistry because it goes beyond all experience and never in chemistry should we go beyond all experience. Uh, and so you have this sort of baby bear theory, chemical equivalents. On the other hand, in the 18th century you had affinity theory, which was an attempt to infer Newtonian forces between corpuscles from combining weights. Yes? You really wanted a state equation. Now, that's a Papa Bear theory. It was way more detailed than the evidence could possibly warrant, and it went nowhere. What do we want? We want a Mama Bear theory that's just right. Yes? That's exactly what we got in the 19th century from a combination of the ideas of Galton, Guy Lussac and Avogadro, and the guy who combined them was Cannizzaro. So we covered a lot of continent or whatever. Uh, but the fact is, the atomic theory, Dalton's atomic theory, the kind you learn in high school chemistry, was just right for the data. Equivalent theory, too little. Affinity theory, too much, just right. Our problem with brains, I think, is finding the mama bear level. And um, so let me give you an example where I think we may be do, doing 
Papa Bear modeling, too detailed. So the, one of the most influential, maybe the most influential framework for analyzing fMRI data is uh, called dynamical causal models. It's due to a group led by Carl Fruston at, uh, at uh, wherever, the Wellcome Trust, actually. Uh, again, your country. Uh, the, um, and the idea is you literally develop a mathematical model of a physical kind for what's going on in the brain, not at the cellular level, but at the aggregated level. Uh, and uh, you write a linear differential equation for neural activity, which you don't observe. You write a function of how your fMRI signals depend on the neural activity in an area, yeah? And that produces a time series. You separate input, which affects the activity of some of the variables directly, from modulatory variables, which essentially changes these coefficients uh, and influences over time how strongly or weakly these edges uh, act. So you have a detailed quantitative model, yes, with a force law, yeah, the whole thing, or at least looks like a force law. Uh, now, it turns out uh, there's a way, in fact, the, the uh, dynamic causal modelers have this whole fleet of software called statistical parametric mapping. It turns out if you, uh, and they have a way of comparing the probabilities of models. They're essentially posterior probabilities on a Bayesian model. They put a prior over them. They assume models have equal probabilities. They compute the posterior in what is essentially a standard way up to obscure approximations. Uh, but it turns out that if you separate, as they do, this is, by the way, uh, a standard example repeated in scores of studies, or mostly scores of expositions, uh, uh, for the visual cortex. That's as much as I know about it. Uh, the input actually has three features they separate. And these are the modulatory variables. And this is his input variable. Well, it turns out that um, if, in fact, you do an exhaustive search for modulations, you want to put in almost everything. This is almost a saturated model. Uh, what turns out to be uh, even more puzzling is that oh, here's, here's their best model. Here's all the possible models in which you could allow any of these associations between the modulations and the strengths of edges. And you see that about a third of the possible models are better than the model that is standardly reported. Uh, and here's actually the most probable DCM model. And it turns out to be one where these guys have dual roles, which is not allowed in a framework. Yes? yes it's like these guys are cross-dressers or something. Uh, motion not only affects B5, but it also modulates this edge. And similarly, attention does uh, similarly. Uh, and it turns out that's enormously more probable than anything else you can uh, do with their data. What does that make me think, or at least guess? Possibly what we're doing here is trying to get too much out of the data. Yeah, I mean, it's not a knockdown argument. It's merely a suggestion. Uh, so let's think about mama bear ambitions. Let's be a little more modest and ask, uh, can we do something relatively simple? Could we find the feed-forward structure of a cascade of effects from a stimulus? Now, not all the effects, remember, not every effect, presumably there may be very well, effects all over the brain. Yes, if I go, woo, woo, God knows what's happening to his brain. Maybe it's all over the place, yes? <laughs> but, uh, but, but can we find some big effects? Yeah, can we find some of them? And there are technical reasons why you want to look for the feed-forward structure. If you think as, um, by the way, if you want to know questions about any of the brain stuff that goes on here, you ask him. Uh, uh, so I'm told that um, you know, there are back projections everywhere. So you get the feed-forward structure. You can put in the back projections. You get the feed-forward structure, you're, you're, you're in good shape. So there's a mama bear. There's a mama bear ambition, and it's um, not so huge. Well, 
we can actually do that. We can, we can find that feed forward structure, or so I claim. So I want to give you a little technical background. This is the boring part. Yeah? So you go to sleep, and the pictures come back later. Um, so first of all, we represent causal relations by directed graphs. And for the moment, we're going to assume the graphs don't have cycles. Things don't go back to where they start, even though we're dealing with systems that do have feedback projection. And we are going to assume our graphs are associated with probability distributions on the variables by what is called a Markov factorization. And all the Markov factorization means is just this. Basically, you write the joint probability of all the variables by starting with the guys that don't have anything coming out of them. You write their probability conditional on the guys going into them. Yeah? And you multiply all those together. And the guys that don't have anything going into them, you just write their probabilities. And that's a Markov factorization. And it corresponds to a set of independence relations on the probability distribution or conditional independence. And they're intuitive. S is independent of x and y given w. Yeah? So just think about this, the causal structure you built in your basement, right? Yeah? Now you reach in. And you freeze old W. He doesn't get to change. Yes? Then if you wiggle X and Y, since you've frozen old W, and there's no way for X and Y to get to S except through W, and you didn't let W change, yeah, these guys would be independent. And similarly, statistically, they're independent according to the Markov factorization. So you get a set of independence relations out of the Markov factorization. Uh, and that means that different graphs fall into classes that are equivalent by their Markov factorization or equivalent by the set of conditional independence relations they imply. So these three graphs, for example, all imply one conditional independence relation. X and Z are independent conditional on Y. They are Markov equivalent. From independence, conditional independence relation, you can't tell without doing interventions whether this is the causal structure or this one or this one. Yeah? Here's another equivalence class. It happens to be a singleton. X causes Y and Z causes Y. That has one property related to independence. X and Z are independent. There's no conditional independence at all. And indeed, it's the structure underlying famous puzzles in popular probability. Um, OK. so. Remember our problem, we want to just find a feed-forward structure. We just want to find a graphical causal structure that results from giving a stimulus by looking at the fMRI time series, or at least we want to try. So here's an algorithm. We start with an empty graph and a uniform that should be prior. Never mind, it was late. Yes, thank you. Automatic correction over there, right? Uh, and a uniform prior, you add the single edge Markov equivalence class that gives you the highest posterior probability of all single edge Markov equivalence classes you can add. And then you continue that way until no more edge additions can be made. And then you go back. You back up. So it's, it's like, for those of you who know regression, it's like a stepwise regression. Yes? in both directions, except what you're searching over is not graphs. You're searching over the Markov equivalence class. And that's important. If you do the search over the graphs, you get lost. You never get the right result. It, in principle, it might work, but it never does in practice. You search over the Markov equivalence class, it works. This idea is due to Chris Meek at Microsoft, uh, his doctoral thesis uh, with Peter Spertes and me at, uh, at Carnegie Mellon a uh, long time ago. Uh, and uh, yippee, it works. So let me give you an example. You start with the empty graph. Um, you, uh, you add an equivalence class, a one edge equivalence class. X goes to Y, or Y goes to X. That's a Markov equivalence class. Can't tell which way it goes, right? Uh, then uh, the algorithm uh, does another computation. It says, oh, I got to add something new. Yeah? Uh, uh, I've got to. Uh, 
make it a two-edge Mark off equivalence class, and I get three directed acyclic graphs. And finally, uh, I, um, I go on and I do a three-edge graph, and lo and behold, uh, some of these guys drop out, the structure gets changed, and I get actually a singleton Markov equivalence class. That can happen, it seems like magic, but there it goes. Now, you might ask, how do you compute the posterior probabilities? I hate this part. You use, you need, you need to do it fast, right? You got to do it for all the zillion models, right? You got to do it for all these edges, yeah? We're trying to do it for, in the case that we're going to talk about, we're only talking about 11 variables, but we want to run on 100 and more variables, yeah? You've got to compute those posterior probabilities fast. So you use something called the Bayes information criterion, which you can compute like math. Uh, and um, it's the wrong thing to use if you're, using non-Gaussian, yeah, uh, uh, non-linear systems. Wrong in a certain sense, yes? What you're really trying to decide is independence, yes? This is a good test, essentially, for correlation measures. For, this is for the normal distribution, uh, the BIC formula for the normal distribution. But, all right, so independence implies zero correlation. Conditional independence implies Zero partial correlation, not conversely, yeah, <coughs> hope. Uh, hope is good. Uh, that's where Obama and I agree. Uh, okay, what are the advantages of doing this? Oh, I should say, by the way, if you use the right family of distributions, BIC is consistent under quite general assumptions I won't bore you with. That is to say, provably. In the large sample limit, it converges probability one to the true Markov equivalence class. Not under the conditions we're using it, however. Uh, so, what are the advantages? Well, GES, the greedy equivalent search, looks over the Markov equivalence classes. Uh, the Markov equivalence classes code conditional independence. With a normal distribution, we get equivalent scores to uh, Markov equivalent graphs. Uh, the uh, residual sum of squares can be rapidly estimated, so the BIC score can. Uh, for uh, a normal distribution, we're essentially um, doing conditional independence. Uh, using vanishing partial correlations rather than actual correct uh, independence tests tends to make false edge emissions rather than false positives. Eh? We're looking for a sparse graph, so clever us. Uh, uh, when there is a choice between fitting an unconditional independence of variables and a conditional independence, GS tends to prefer the unconditional independence. That turns out to be important in how we avoid problems with cycles. Uh, sparse graphs can be found by increasing the penalty term in the BIC score. Let's go back. Oh, BIC score. Here's the penalty term. Yeah? Yeah? Notice this K, it's a constant. Yeah? If you push that up, it still converges. It just converges differently. Yes? But it still gets there. Yeah? And if you push that up, you are essentially prejudicing for sparse graphs. There turns out to be a reason I don't have time to discuss why you want sparse graphs. It's because you're measuring indirectly. The variables whose causal structure you're trying to get at are latent. If, in fact, you try to get the latent structure, the full latent structure, from the measured variables in these circumstances, you will get false positive connections unless you drive the graphs to be sparse. And I'll, I'll be happy to talk about the statistics and draw pictures. Uh, just don't ask me about brains. All right. One question there. Is it a practical consideration or a theoretical? Theoretical. Uh, now, what, what do we do when we have lots of subjects? Yeah? In fact, what we actually have is multiple subjects. The crummy data he gives us, yes? We've got lots of subjects. And as predicted, yes, different ones show different sets of active regions of interest. So they don't all show the same regions of interest. 
How could you possibly apply this procedure? Well, that's easy. You essentially do the GES procedure, but at each step of the procedure, you evaluate the posterior or the BIC score on each subject where the variables involved in that particular edge occur, average them together. Turns out that is also a BIC score. If you were actually doing independent samples from the same distribution, or even if it were a linear model, if you actually had a random effects model, the procedure would be convergent. In the present case, there's no proof that the procedure is convergent, and I can give you examples where it isn't. But it works pretty good. Uh, OK, so if we do that, we get what we call images. And it preserves Markov equivalence. It gives us a BIC score. It works over multiple subjects. It works with missing variables. So why do you think it will work? Well, I don't know. So here's one. You know, you can apply it to empirical data sets where people have worked them over and over and over. So here's the SPM8 three-variable trivial case. They, this data set's been worked a lot, yeah? Uh, what happens? Well, actually, what happens is that GES gives you the feed-forward structure immediately, like in seconds. Not a second. Uh, same problem, same data set, GES actually gives you not the most probable model, but a close guide to it. Because what GES gives you is the feedforward structure. You know there are feedback structures, so you put in the feedback, yes? And then if you run these ancillary variables that are supposed to be just modulators according to the SPM8, manual, and you let them be variables in the GES search, in the greedy equivalent search, the greedy equivalent search says, OK, they actually affect V5 and V1 or V5. Now, adopt the following principle. Try the models where the ancillary variables actually are direct effects, and then test whether adding modulations, which are of edges, into the edges they are attached to, sorry, into the variables they are attached to. Yeah? And we just test them by the SPM8 posterior probability calculation. This is one of the three suggested models by the GS procedure I've just outlined, and it's the most probable model. Yeah? In terms of the procedure you're describing, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You really have to belt it out because I have this thing. Yeah. What is the modulo how different is adding a modulo coordinate oh, to adding an edge? Oh, entirely different. Entirely different. So one of the sad things about science is that outside of these anomalous communities, search is anathema. Yes. So so far as I know, nobody has ever done this. I, I can, my, you know, I don't know this literature, but I know at least a dozen publications of this example. Yes? And there are probably 50. As far as I know, nobody ever did an exhaustive search of the modulatory connections. Yes? If you're asking whether motion directly affects V5, yeah, that is just part of the GES search. If you're asking whether motion modulates the edge, it's not part of the GES search. And actually, what we did was an exhaustive search over all possibilities. Uh, what are there? There are 256 of them. Uh, for these two possible guides of modulators. And uh, you know, that's what computers are for. I guess sort of the, the, the question tagging that one would be, so what does adding a modulatory connection change in the probability distribution of the variable? Because I'm sorry, how do, what does it do? What does it do to the probability, to the joint probability distribution of the variable you add once you add a modulatory edge? Well, what adding a modulatory edge does, I don't want to go back, but uh, if you look at that technical formula, he's got x dot equals ax plus b something, right? That's actually, that b is an interaction term. And you could be a social scientist, standard social science model, right? You write, if I write a regression model, I could add an interaction term. 
Well, that's what that is is an interaction term, literally. And uh, the only the difference is, of course, it's that's it's a latent system, and the dependent variable is a derivative. It's not, but otherwise, it's just a standard interaction term, kind you might find in many regression models. Um, okay. So here's another reason. Yeah, I believe in simulation. It's important that your simulations not fake it. So, um, uh, so what we did was we built clusters of nodes. The clusters of nodes uh, had half their neighbors interacting with them. Yes, they all had feedback relations. The, the outputs were nonlinear. They were actually a sigmoid function. The outputs were subject to noise. Uh, so the inputs are summative. Then you apply uh, essentially a hyperbolic tangent function scale appropriately. Then you add noise. Then you add, so, so you've got this cluster of nodes like this. And then you've got another cluster of nodes. And you have connections between them of the same form and feedback. Yeah? So, and now for each of those clusters, you have a simulated hemodynamic response function yeah, to your measured variable, which is measured with noise. How do you estimate the noise? We took the best fitting model for his data, and we looked at the residuals, and that was our noise. So that's how we simulate. Um, everything's nonlinear, indirectly measured. You can do more, of course. Uh, in fMRI measurements, there are differing time delays in the time series according to tissue. You can simulate those. You can leave out variables. We randomly left out variables. What's the result? Uh, you can run, you can run uh, the images program over these simulated data. What's the reliability? Uh, it makes about 20% false <coughs> positive judgments in when you put in all the crap you can imagine. Well, here's some real cases. This is a case uh, uh, that uh, Russ uh, and his associates published in Science to 2000, 13 variables, uh, 13 subjects, 11 variables. Um, uh, there were six variables shared by all subjects. Uh, this was a gambling uh, case. And um, here's what images produces on two different pre-processing. They're very similar structures. Uh, one has one extra edge, uh, two extra edges, the other doesn't. And uh, I don't know whether <coughs> this is the right structure or not, but I, can, I am quoting Russ, yes, the classically expected structure, yes. I have to assure you there was no, we didn't know, we didn't prepare the reasons of interest. We have no clue how <coughs> brains work, yes. For all we knew, it all should have gone this way. Uh, the only prior knowledge given to the algorithm was that the input, yes, is not affected by the brain variable. Yeah? Nothing else. Um, this is uh, data from uh, Jouet and Poldrack. This has 16 subjects, eight variables. There are no missing variables. This is rhyming and non-rhyming words and non-word stimuli. Uh, Russ can tell you more about it. Uh, we uh, get a structure. I don't know whether it's uh, true or not. Actually, uh, if you go to uh, go to some of the independent literature, there's independent evidence for some of these kinds. Uh, just to be clear, those were actually backwards. So this is the data from the gambling study, and the other one was the data from the writing. Oh, what the hell? Just because people <laughs> one or the other, yeah. That they were backwards. It's oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> you are right. See, all I care about the numbers. Yes, you're you're entirely right. Thank you, as you would be. Now. You might ask, what about, un un what about confounding? I mean, you don't know. You I deliberately left out. Yeah. So you go back a couple of slides. The, one of the errors was correction. No, 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 no difference. Oh, look at that. Where you had the two brains side by side. Yeah, one of them did. So between, like, LCL and LCL. Right. LCL, this guy LCL. has an edge going back here. Yeah, and on. And this guy. Doesn't. It's going up. Yeah. yeah, this guy goes this way. 
I'm sorry? Oh, oh, very good. All right, so they're running the same data diff treated differently. This is, in fact, let me put that off. Can I put it off? Because I'll be happy to explain it, but otherwise we'll keep people who are really bored out of their minds there too long. Uh, all right, so um, why isn't there a confounding problem? Couldn't there be latent variables? Well, sure they could, but they have to be weak. Uh, and here's why. Uh, if I've got a structure x, y, z, and I know x is exogenous, I know this arrow doesn't go this way, yeah? Then I have that x is independent of z given y. If I have a confounder, a common cause, suppose that I didn't measure this guy, yeah? But he's there, he's making y and z co-vary, dirty rotten scoundrel. Yeah? Then uh, I will have x independent of z. Suppose, uh, suppose I have both. I've got this thing going the wrong way, and I've got this guy's a common cause. Yes? I'll again have x independent of z. In other words, the data will make a difference. Now notice what I can't tell. I can't tell the difference between this guy going this way, yeah? This guy going this way. Yeah, no confounding, and this guy going this way, and confounding. But in either case, I've got this causal chain, and all I claimed was to give you a sparse graph that was true. I didn't claim to give you the whole story. Actually, I could tell this difference, but never mind. Yeah? So we actually have a statistical argument that when we find directed edges, uh, it's not from confounding. What about feedback cycles? So I said we we're going to find a feed-forward structure, but um, uh, what if I've got a cycle like this? So here's my input. It goes to Y. If that goes to Z, and there's feedback. Yeah. What happens? Well, I'm forcing an acyclic graph. Yes, I'm forcing, and it turns out these differ in the conditional independence and independent structures, yes, that they force, and so in how well they fit the data, and GS prefers this one, i.e. it gets the feed forward structure right. Um, so when is a brain like the planet? Well, the answer is when it thinks. Thank you. Thomas, questions on this before we go to general discussion? You had a question I didn't answer, so let me deal with that first. Um, so I've got, I've got time series data. I have, and that time series is from a process I've sampled um, in any particular slice. I've, the, the, the measurements are what, a second, two seconds apart, yes? So, but the processes I'm sampling are much faster than that, yes? So here's a worry you could have, yeah? The processes that, because I'm, my sampling rate is slower than the causal processes, there may be associations that are produced just because I'm sampling too slowly. And um, it's, it's easy to draw graphs with examples of so here's one way you can do this. Don't worry about it. Yeah? I mean, you know, the preprocessors have taken out long-term autocorrelation already. You know, just treat the cases as IID, screw it. Yes? Uh, and um, see what happens. That was the structure you saw on the left, the one that was a little too complicated, that had the air going up. Here's, here's another idea. What do I do? What do I do uh, when I think there may be autocorrelation just from my sampling rate? Call an econometrician. So uh, Clive Granger, who died last year from down, uh, down the road, um, uh, had this idea about what you, uh, what you uh, do about causality. It's Granger causality, and you basically 
do a regression of all the past or as much of the past as you choose, however many lags you got, and you ask whether adding an additional variable makes a difference to the prediction of y. Uh, and if it does, then you say that additional variable is a cause. If it does, it doesn't. Well, okay, so in the sampling problem, it doesn't work so well. So Granger actually suggested, along with Swanson, uh, in, uh, gosh, I don't know, maybe the 80s, uh, that you use, um, that instead what you should do is take the time series residuals. Yeah? So basically, I'm going to regress x, y, z yeah, on all the past of x, y, z. And standard methods for doing that. Yeah? That's how we produce the finite time series. And then I'm going to look at the residuals. And I'm going to ask, OK, can I figure out a causal structure amongst the residuals? Now, Ranger was a very conservative guy. Yeah? So he said, well, let's just allow, let's just allow that the only causal relations amongst the residuals can be chains like this. Uh, Right? Um, they've all got to be some nice linear relation. Uh, that is to say, they've all got to be nicely linearly ordered. And you may not know which goes where and what order or what direction, but good on him. He, he wrote this paper in uh, JASA. Thing. Uh, Gleemore has this wonderful method for deciding amongst these models. Actually, it wasn't a very good method. And he used it. So basically, what he did was apply a machine learning procedure to the residuals, yeah? to try to capture what's going on faster than the sampling rate. And uh, Kevin Hoover uh, at Virginia Tech now, uh, used to be up the road at Davis, long road, uh, uh, essentially applied a different class of algorithms than the one I've described uh, to this same, this same uh, residual set. And so you actually get a graphical model of, uh, of what's going on faster. So that second long answer to the question, that second graph you saw was produced just from the residuals by applying the greedy equivalent search or images to the residuals. And it turns out to be a little sparse. <laughs> Sorry about that. But you see why I didn't want to stop. Yeah. What we had is three very formative talks on three different topics. <laughs> and I'd like to now open up the floor, ask anyone a question, any of our speakers a question, or if you want to uh, come up and uh, try to find a way to pull them all together, that's fine too. Uh, in other words, it's, everything's fair, up to a point. <laughs> uh, I'll be the referee on what's fair. But uh, anything is fair. Anyone have any comments? Anything you, uh, you want to say? Anyone? Yeah. Do yeah, you want to come up here and speak so we can get it in here? Well, I think you guys can speak up. Uh, uh, you asked us to be uh, provocative. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I wanted to ask Mrs. Lazar a question. Um, and please understand that this, uh, I, I want to address less the issues about the statistics we produced at the daily of the universe. I have a high way of understanding any anatomical basis of the results we show. Because if I think of whatever I knew about new anatomy, uh, any of the maps you've shown resemble very little anything I could imagine when you deal with any task below. I assume that. Uh, a lot of the issues that uh, uh, come with this uh, uh, idea are based on the fact that you do some averaging, you do some uh, smoothing, you do some nonlinear registration. And I'm just wondering whether all the amount of work you spent into this uh, uh, by comparing the different statistical tests and so on and, and this subdivision and so it's just spoiled by the fact that you're on, on the input you put in data which you cannot uh, compare at that level. I would strongly suggest uh, uh, 
to try to give up all this illusions, losing and so on, and work on the individual level on, uh, by analyzing data on an individual basis. Okay. Okay, um, so we actually, th there's a lot of processing that goes in, it's true. We actually, in our own work, don't do a lot of the sort of typical smoothing spatially or temporally that's often done in these types of analyses. So that at that level, we do try to work with data that are more raw than is typical and hope that our methods will somehow bring out things that are hopefully, hopefully true, whatever true means. I'm not really sure I want to use that word anyway. Um, the regions that, that we showed are actually ones that our colleagues who have, who work with these data a lot do believe have anatomical meaning and are anatomically relevant to the tasks that, that we've been showing. So this, these were visual tasks we find regions in the eye fields, in the frontal eye fields, in the supplementary eye fields, and other areas that are anatomically relevant to the tasks that, that we're showing, and have been replicated in many other studies, not just by our colleagues, but in many other labs as well. So, Perhaps should be more specific. Okay. You've shown me a contour map. Yeah. And these contour maps have areas which have a diameter more than two centimeters, I guess. Perhaps three centimeters. Yeah. Sure. Well, Right, we've shown one slice, yeah. But they are just blobs. They are just blobs, but yes. Yes. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. <coughs> okay. Okay, I, I, I understand. I think I understand a little bit better what you're saying now. Um, we do. We do also look at things individually, and as I started to uh, describe in, in reaction to the previous question, one of the things that we are really interested in looking at is the variability from subject to subject, because if there's too, well, too much subject to subject variability, and this all kind of gets smeared around, and, and you see these pretty maps that look like blobs, but don't actually reflect what's going on in any individual subject, and maybe that's what you're, what you're saying, or? Yeah. Okay. Sure. You do any kind of statistical analysis in order to detect significantly activated regions, but in individual subjects. Yes. Then you have individual activation costs. Yes. And then you can use any statistics you can imagine to build group inferences from these individual pictures. But then you can get rid of any uh, any questionable registration procedures, any questionable smoothing procedures. You can decide by comparing case, each case which regions in each individual map you want to compare across the that's where I disagree with you. I think, yes, you can look at the individuals, and we do look at the individuals. There's a huge amount of variability, individual to individual, on what regions get, would get picked up as foci of activation by that, in that case. Um, but then making that transition from the, in, from the subjects to the group, you're still going to have to deal with somehow equalizing what you see from the individual subject maps. I, and so you're still going to have that problem of things getting smeared around. Yeah. It's, and so. And this is, I think, where you should invest your thinking. I think this is the sextant idea that you have. Mm -hmm. It's meaningless. Because in one case, you could have the spot in one sex, uh, sector, and in another subject, it could be just in a different sector, just because it's just on the form. So Quite possibly. Uh, Quite possibly.
petition from the individual member to the Duca on any basis of the Duca. He wants to throw in a word in here. So, I mean, in the end, this is kind of a strategy question, right? What's the right strategy for doing this? People have made this argument for a long time. In the end, this, this, this group strategy has worked. I mean, you, you know, make, can show you meta-analyses. You see very consistent things across big groups of people. It may well have been that things are so all over the place that it doesn't work, but um, the field has decided that it does. I mean, I'm always amazed. There's so many reasons why fMRI shouldn't work, it yet it does. <laughs> well, of course it does. I mean, I, I, was, I was part in St. Dozen of these studies. But the question is, what did you lose? What did you not find by doing this? Absolutely. And I think this is even more important. And it may be, it, it may be correct that in the old days when you were working with pet data, you had to do group studies because your signal-to-noise ratio was not good enough. But now that we have fMRI, that now that we have high field scanners and so on, we can do statistics in individual cases. Sure, but it's, it's not clear to me how you... Can I insert something into the yes. argument? It seems to me whether you've lost information depends on what you want to do with it. So, for example, Newton loses for me a great deal of information. Now, he just gives me these laws, and I don't need all the numbers anymore. I've just got the laws. Scientific conclusions are information loss, yes? Uh, they're important information loss. They're useful information loss. On the other hand, sometimes we lose information, and in doing so, we destroy the possibility of getting to our goal. I assume in, I've got continuous variables, and I collapse them into binary variables. Uh, so it seems to me that you know, one needs to be a little more articulate in criticism about what the purpose is uh, for which uh, the loss is troublesome. Yes, of course. I just wanted to say that perhaps, perhaps the work you did in, in comparing those different statistics is to me a bit, a bit moot because I question the data you put into there. Yeah? So I think, uh, well, to be well, very provocative at this point, this doesn't make too much sense drawing, about, uh, drawing inferences about the comparison as long as I don't know what kind of, or well, drawing any conclusions from the results you've shown, from the images you've shown, the statistical images, about the processes and the relevance of the results that we see over there, when to me the data grouping is questionable. Bill, you want, Bill wants to be, be comment here. I'd like to propose a moderate intermediate theory here. It's possible that fMRIs work in some contexts, but don't work in other contexts. And one of the things that I'm thinking about right now is all of this wonderfully exciting work that's been done by Russ and other people on pattern recognition and extracting some indicant of what a person might be thinking that seems to be extracted from the brain image. Well, a curious thing is in the literature, beginning to appear in the literature now, and, there's, and it has to do with the neutrality of these pattern recognition methods. It's possible that you have information there, but and it's in the pattern, but depending upon what analytic technique you use, what the kernel of your uh, analysis method is, you may um, get a different mapping of the neural mechanisms. So the, if, if this is the case, then it's possible that there is additional information that we didn't expect, but it's in formulated or extracted in a way that loses all the neurophysiological implications. I pose that as a question. Does it sound plausible? I think the first thing I would say is don't steal the point from my talk tomorrow. <laughs> so the second one is you're absolutely correct. Is you, which? <laughs> well, no. The classifier, any classifier you throw, has an inductive bias of some sort. It's how it knows how to extrapolate from the data that it has seen to make predictions about the data that it's going to see in the future, and that 
influences the conclusions that you can draw. The second point that's related to that is this can actually be done in the reverse direction. And it goes to, towards one thing you said in your talk, which was that maybe you just didn't have, we're looking at a signal that's at too high a level relative to the processes underneath. Maybe that is the case. Maybe you can still throw many classifiers and not find anything. But you can also use this in reverse. So one example of this is, I don't know how many people have seen the paper in Nature by Jack Callan's group. It's one where they are saying, we have a model for what's happening underneath. We are calibrating that model in, and setting the parameters there to replicate the fMRI measurement we have. And then we are testing it on new stimuli. So you can use those tools to do it in the reverse direction. And the third thing, and this ties, goes towards your criticism, is that the, whether the, the locations actually overlap across multiple subjects is kind of a red herring. Because if what you're interested in is there is some relationship between voxels in one subject, maybe across multiple conditions, not just two, then what you want to show is that this, there is the same relationship between the patterns in different conditions across all the subjects that you have. And that would argue what having a model that describes that in terms of a few variables, like what you were saying, a few latent ones we can't see, which manifests in different differently structured brains in the different subjects that you have. And there's no reason not that we, why we can't do that. In fact, there's a few people doing it in a couple of different ways. Did you just mention the Gallant paper? Yes. The reconstruction? Yes. Thing? I really have to make a comment about that. Uh, for, forgive me for taking up so much time, but uh, the, no Gal <laughs> the, the Gallant paper uh, may or may not work. It, it, and as a matter of fact, um, if it works at all, it's really an impressive, a, a gigantically impressive piece of work. But there's one thing that just is absolutely destroying uh, our credibility in that, and that's the word reconstruction. For the psychologists in this room, they know that that has a very specific meaning. It means that you reconstruct from its parts an image or a rec it's different than recognizing something. And as I understand it, there's no reconstruction here. The, the word reconstruction implies to me that they did some MRIs, processed the MRIs, and projected these on a television screen. And that's not what's happening. To the best, and this paper is very complicated, I must admit that I haven't yet studied it in great detail, but what they have done is work with a bunch of a priori or uh, what Bayesian what we call priors and then select from among those one based upon certain aspects of the MRI and that's vastly different than what the word reconstruction implies to a, a lot of us. Uh, thank you. The key part there which is that they did exactly what you said and then they tried it on new data that they hadn't seen before. The fact that they could do the prediction there tells you, I mean, you might object to reconstruction, but you can't object to the fact that their model at least has predictive power. It might not correspond exactly to reality, selecting, but it's predictive. Selecting isn't like the magician who picks, says, here's a dozen cards, I will pick out a card, and then he, by some magical twist, pulls it out. But, but they didn't. Please tell me if they, if they did do what I think they implying they did, I think it would be worth the Nobel, all Nobel Prizes, and that is to go directly from the brain signals to a depiction on the uh, a television screen. They didn't do that, did they? But someone else has. Yes. No. I, I, yeah, um, was it uh, Kenneth Tani? Yes. Yeah. With, you know, pretty impoverished stimuli, but, but they have done it. Was it the neuron paper? And it didn't include selection from a pre-trained set. I have to hear more about that. Clark, do you want to say something? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I moved over to the guys. Well, you wrote something on the board. Well, oh, I, have, I just wanted to show you I was in Iran. Yeah. Uh, it seemed to me that you raised a bunch of questions. One was individual variation. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, the data that. Uh, that Russ provided us, and you look at the graphical models that are produced, yeah, there's considerable individual variation. 
uh, in the structures we get, there's a lot of commonality. Uh, it's very hard to know just uh, what the right measure is. There are interesting features about, uh, for example, how it depends on experimental repetition. It turns out that if you want to make the most stable estimate and you've got an experiment that takes uh, a bit of time, yeah, use the second repetition. Uh, 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 I don't know what to, uh, what to make of the uh, individual variation. I mean, these, these can easily be uh, measurement artifacts. Uh, they can be sampling artifacts. They can be uh, actual different processes, or at least different locales of major significant processes, because that's all we're finding, uh, or claiming to find, uh, in different people. And uh, I don't know how to resolve that. On the other hand, it's not random. I, I assure you. Uh, it's not as though uh, there's no association. I can make lots of measures. I don't know quite what the right one is to, um, to pick out how agreeable the uh, different subjects are in their graphical structure they produce. But uh, it's, it's considerably more than nothing. The second issue you raise is actually holism versus, and I'll have to raise uh, my imagination and invent a word, partism. Yes, um, and uh, I have a view about the history of science. Partism has always won, holism has always failed. Uh, and uh, it, it doesn't matter whether it's chemistry, biology, uh, physics, um, uh, or psychology. Yes, psychology made the enormous advances it did in the late 19th and 20th centuries by essentially trying to take things apart. Uh, that's the very idea of classical neuropsychology. It's, the, uh, it's fundamental to all kinds of experimental strategies. Uh, and um, similarly, I won't go through uh, other natural sciences. But I think holism, uh, if you're betting on his the history of science, is a losing strategy. Uh, third is optimism versus pessimism. Yes? Uh, you're an informed pessimist. I'm an ignorant optimist. Uh, uh, I think in uh, I think in scientific uh, strategies, of course, there's junk science, there's uh, tilting at windmills, but when the issue is complexity, full information versus no information, uh, I vote for optimism. That is, doesn't mean you shouldn't be critical about uh, uh, results, about methods. It doesn't mean you shouldn't uh, ask uh, for tests and raise exactly the kinds of issues you're raising, but uh, uh, I, I think uh, global pessimism about what goes on uh, between the ears and the tongue, in my case not much, uh, is, uh, is uh, well, the pessimism is actually about whether we can analyze it in a partist way, yes? And I treat, treat partism very very broadly. I mean, we are now working on trying to develop graphical models for 20,000 boxes. Yeah, um, just, I mean, two orders of magnitude bigger than we're, three orders of magnitude bigger than I, sh than I showed you. And you'd expect enormous individual variation in a case like that. So you'd like to find robust parts. But the point is that uh, it's still partisan. Uh, and I think optimism consists in trying doesn't consist in saying, aha, I got it, except, of course, when I have it. Uh, and that, of course, brings us to degrees of ambition. I mean, uh, I don't know how to, how to decide the degrees of ambition. I would be a lot more ambitious than uh, uh, my colleague Bill Eddy, uh, uh, or than most members of the statistics department. I want to find causal connections. Um, but I wouldn't be as ambitious as those who want uh, literal physical details from the kinds of data we have. But I think that's, a, that's an important issue. And obviously what happens is people make different career choices about it. Yeah? Question Sorry. Um, Speak up loudly, please. Um, back to point two. Yeah. That holism failed. And part of one. Yeah. Um, the holism failed and part of one. Is that because you don't believe in holism? Or is it because it's, it was much easier to take an reductionistic approach? Oh, I wasn't alive. I wasn't alive. <laughs> right? <laughs> that's an historical point. So let's. I mean, let's talk about some... Because it is easier to study the parts, and it's much harder to <coughs> understand how it all works together. Well, I mean, we break things, 
Yeah? We separate things. We hold parts constant. And by part, of course, I mean aspects, not just spatially localized. Spatially localized pieces. But, you know, I mean, we have a history with this. Uh, uh, if, you, if you look at chemistry in the late 90s, well, who was the most famous physical chemist in the world in 1902? Wilhelm Ostfeld. Albert Einstein, when we graduated from the ETH, applied to be Wilhelm Oswald's assistant. Oswald turned him down. Uh, Oswald did not believe in atoms. He was an energeticist, and his idea was that he could account for all of uh, the phenomena of uh, 19th century chemistry uh, on energeticist principles. I mean, he was a big classical thermodynamics. Well, you know, you think about that is essentially not analyzing what's going on into pieces and parts interacting. Uh, and it was a blind alley. Now, you know, historical arguments are lame in a certain sense, of course, right? I mean, the brain might be different from everything else that we've looked at in science. Not everything, but almost everything. It might be a case where you really need holistic, wave, nonlinear hoosies. Yes? and never mind the parts. But, you know, what you're, what you're doing here, this is not theorem proving. This is betting, right? It's betting your time, your life, your career. Yeah? Where are you, where are you gonna go? Yeah? What are you gonna look at? So, one answer is, let's do classical <coughs> psychology as it's evolved in the 20th century. Yes, skillful, brilliant, robust results, especially about uh, vision and uh, Uh, some other things, uh, and lots of individual variation, of course. Or we can open the box, at least indirectly, and uh, make our best guess about what kind of structure we can find in it. Now, I mean, there, there are different enterprises. I mean, you can look at the brain with fMRI or EEG, and you can say, okay, what can I do to use this for classifying? Irina Risch, who uh, did uh, a degree or a postdoc here, who's now at uh, uh, who's now at IBM, has uh, interesting new work on classifying schizophrenics from um, essentially the Gaussian random field of um, fMRI images, and she gets excellent classifications. So again, you, your issue, you know, some of the schizophrenics may not be schizophrenic. Some of the normals may be weird, but. Uh, uh, that may account for why her classification isn't perfect, who knows? Uh, nonetheless, she gets uh, a separation of the court as well with clinical decisions. Now, from my point of view, that's useful technology. It's interesting, uh, just as I find Gallant's work interesting. Yeah? But in a certain sense, it's avoiding the main issue. The main issue is how does the brain do it? How does it possibly bring about uh, marvelous array of capacities, unfortunately judging from the state of the world insufficiently but, uh, but uh, how does the brain bring about cognition, awareness, competence, planning, action, etc. And so while I regard a lot of these things as interesting and, and socially useful, the, the real issue is sort of trying to get imaging and single and multiple cell studies uh, to come together and uh, give us increasingly constrained grip on how the brain works. That's, that's my picture of what we're about, or what we should do. Good. And then I'll get you next. Go. I have to respond, since I've been identified with all these things. Let's do it in order, individual variation. There is a lot of inter-subject variation. I think that's what we've been talking about. But as I understand the literature, individual subjects do pretty well at uh, repeating their patterns from subject to subject. So the problem is when the patterns are so uh, abstract or so uh, scattered that we don't know exactly what their significance is, we can't use them to either build a theory or to develop some therapy. 
that even no matter how well a person replicates from uh, trial to trial to trial, uh, unless there's some generality, the individual variability is useless. Secondly, the holism and partism, uh, that's a grand old uh, Cartesian uh, problem. Uh, Descartes was the one who really talked about the method of breaking things up into parts. And it works for systems that can be broken up. But there are some systems th that it's not capable. You don't have what psychologists call pure insertion, which means that you can do something like the Donders task, where you try to leave out a particular component and see how it changes the reaction time. When you try to do that, uh, you always get kind of fuzzy, indeterminate data. And the reason is that process A, B, that's a process that's composed of three parts, A, B, and C, it can't uh, it be the same. A and C are not going to behave the same when B is taken out of them. So although ideally we would like to be Cartesians and follow his method, we really can't. And we have to look not towards a uh, gross kind of holism like um, uh, the uh, equipotentiality idea, but rather uh, some kind of an intermediate uh, state where we deal with different kinds of chunks. Third, about the optimism and pessimism, I am, uh, I thank you for the phrase, I'd never been classified as an informed uh, optimist, but I don't think that's the right word. I think I'm a realist, and th that is because I'm aware, and I think many of the other people in this room are also aware of the fact that there are already some known constraints on how we can deal with these complicated networks. Uh, constraints uh, uh, of uh, computability and, and uh, tractability, and also uh, some less well-known constraints. There's a gentleman by the name of Klaus Hartag had a Scientific American article recently on something else, but in a decade or so ago, he pointed out that there's no way to determine the hierarchy of organization of a complex system like the multiple modes of the visual system, that it's impossible. It's not a matter of just getting more data. It, every time you add more data, you also add more degrees of freedom, and it is formally proven that you cannot um, uh, determine this property of hierarchy. Uh, ambition. I've been in this business a long time and my ambitions are unlimited, but I also want to be realistic about um, what can be done. And I think that those of us who have taken on a critical role and who might well be called curmudgeons um, are performing a useful function too. If you were a graduate student right now. I want you up here, I want you up here. It's a short question. No, no, your questions are never short. <laughs> <laughs> If you were a graduate student now, what would you, and, and you wanted to study this question, what would you do? I would, uh, I would say follow Russell Poldrack <laughs> and uh, all of the others who are making such wonderful progress in this field uh, because uh, for a purely practical reason that the field has not yet um, gotten to a point where it's going to accept iconoclasts and that unless particularly as a graduate student and particularly in these economic times, it is probably well to stay within the confines of the zeitgeist. And I, I've made that advice to students, save your cranky uh, iconoclasm for uh, after you've retired when you can say anything you want to and it doesn't matter. You want to say something? You're okay now? Anyone else? Who else wants to make something? Okay, come on up. Oh, here, I can turn this around. I'm a little surprised about the way holism is dismissed uh, in terms of physics. I mean, you did mention Einstein, and I thought the theory of relativity would be an example of holism, and I hardly think it's been dismissed. Uh, it's what Einstein called a theory of principles. Uh, he also regarded uh, classical thermodynamics as theories of principle. Uh, he uh, 
contrasted it with theories of composition, such as the atomic theory. Uh, so, sure, uh, we have uh, we have theories of principle. You could even regard Newtonian dynamics as as a theory of principle in Einstein's case. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's it's not as though when uh, Einstein set out to uh, compute orbits, yes, he just said, oh, the solar system is one big uh, thing. I can't analyze it into bits. Uh, to the contrary, he computes the anomalous uh, precession of the orbit of Mercury. Uh, and Not with these equations. He, he, I'm Not sorry? With these equations. I'm sorry? Not with these equations of relativity, though. He uses Newton's method for the perturbation term. Of course. Yeah, but it's not using relativity. Well, of course he's using relativity. He uses he uses a linear approximation to what later turns out to be the Schwarzschild solution. So nonsense. Uh, I'm sure he's using. Well, well, I'm not. I read the paper. <laughs> my uh, area. That's one of my areas of research. I assure you, I'm not wrong. Uh, but uh, well, believe it or not, we can debate that. We can debate that. But the point is. Uh, uh, sure, it's a theory of principle, but it's not a list. Is number two supposed to be a dichotomy that covers all theory, and then you suddenly throw in a new name and say, Einstein's relativity theory isn't holistic, it's this new name. And I didn't catch the name. But uh, it, it seems to me that uh, that when uh, prompted with examples, one should make distinctions. Uh, and uh, you gave me an example. I made a distinction. Actually, uh, it's a it's Einstein's distinction. There is a principle uh, as against. Is it a holistic the theory or a partition theory? I'm sorry. What? Is it holistic or partition? Which? Relativity. Relativity. Uh, relativity is a theory of principle. Yes, and, and he uses it in a non-holistic way. Uh, if he used it in a holistic way, he wouldn't be giving you details of relativistic orbits or approximating them, since you insist he didn't do it. No, we'll, we'll get into that later. This is supposed to be a more brain. If you want to get into relativity and the voting and body problem, I'm the one you want to talk to. Uh, <laughs> any other questions, any uh, comments? Hell, you got any thoughts? Come up and give some thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> come up primarily to confess my uh, part in uh, helping pull this together because unfortunately I couldn't be here at the start and it's not clear how much I'll be here tomorrow. Um, I am a statistician, for those who don't know who I am, and have been working somewhat with uh, a group that's called the um, the FBURN collaboration, um, Functional Brain Imaging Collaboration. Um, I know very little brain imaging, um, which makes me well qualified to uh, help organize this meeting um, and to comment. Um, but so, I, you know, and I, I find some of the points that um, Clark just talked about very interesting. Uh, the part that I ended up getting most involved in with it was actually the within individual repeatability from site to site and day to day, and um, which was the Fburn group one of the wonderful things they did um, before I got involved was send the same people around to eight different sites doing the same task. And we looked at reliability and measurability there and were, you know, found large site-to-site -site differences that um, through great effort, uh, you know, have been shrinking. That is, refining protocols, um, understanding what the machines are doing better, things like that have, have come out and, and reduced that kind of stuff. Um, and as I say, I'm not really a, a brain person. I'm, these days I actually do a fair bit in genetics and it's interesting because many of the arguments being made, I think, uh, resonate there as well. That is, you know, we measure and find SNPs, single nucleotides that seem, you know, we know that they're not really the answer. They're not causing the disease. They're, they're near something maybe that's causing the disease. Uh, you know, and that, that, that kind of partitioning approach um, again, it is kind of leading the way, despite the fact that no one knows for sure that it's the answer. Um, in fact, quite sure it's not the answer um, in that regard. Um, so uh, 
those are, those are the things I, I guess that I know about and have been intrigued by. Um, I actually enjoyed Fritzschaff's comment because, um, you know, it is interesting how much we can kind of um, sweep away, that is, and, um, you know, I, I think it, it just, it leads to interesting directions. That is, we get interesting things out of what we're doing now, and the question is, what might we get if we try to look at kind of point-to-point -point variation, you know, if you had points in individuals, it's a hard statistical problem to take the data that you're talking about and draw the group inferences. Um, and so it's, it's not clear, but it, it's an interesting direction. So that's all. Anybody else wants to want to make some comments? No, you? Yeah. Uh, Come on up. Sure, I'll figure out something as I walk up. <laughs> figure it out as you walk up. Work for me, Tom. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, I'll talk a little bit about individual variability tomorrow and some of our work, but um, I did maybe want to, in terms of listening to Bill and, and Nicole and, and Clark, is um, maybe pose a question, which is, you know, even if we don't know where the, the, the places are, how much work has been done in terms of just like topological similarity, you know, in terms of if subjects are going to be different and there's going to be signal and noise issues, you know, some subjects will have stronger activations than others, but if what really matters is, and, and I don't think everyone is going to be able to answer this, because I don't, I think, you know, the, the formation of consciousness is at a time scale that, you know, fMRI can't hit, but at least it can guide us to figuring out what the networks are and what coherences to look at, possibly with EEG and MEG. But um, I just throw this out in terms of, is there, there's much more interest in, like, the resting state connectivity now, which we'll talk a little bit about tomorrow. A lot of interest in characterizing networks and properties of networks, and I have to think, you know, maybe following up on what you said, Bill, that if, you know, if, if you know, the brain is a network, and it's and what we have is emergent properties of that network. So, you know, arguing about whether this part of the brain or that part of the brain does something actually is probably not. It's not. It, it's sort of hitting the end of, you know, it, it's not going to take us that far, and and it's really going to be differences in network properties between schizophrenia versus control and um, but I'm hoping someone else has a better sense maybe Clark has something to say on in, in terms of whether we can actually do this without actually knowing the actual locations well Clark so we can capture you why don't you come up <laughs> come on we're up for this big guy so I'm getting old <laughs> I'm this, this up and down is killing me uh, so look you can study graph isomorphism without worrying where the nodes are right, right? Um, but um, it occurs to me, I, I don't know whether this will uh, make friends or enemies, that um, the, the case with the, the topological structures, as you call right. them, in, uh, in fMRI and other imaging techniques is, is very much like the case of gene regulatory networks. So um, gene regulatory networks, you know, uh, well, let's, you know, let's take a, Let's take breast tissue, yeah? So you take normal breast tissue and you take uh, breast tissue with a particular kind of tumor, yes? And there will be a different regulatory network, yes? And change the kind of tumor, there'll be still another kind of regulatory network. Uh, normals are pretty similar, yeah? Take normal tissue from one person or another and you get fairly similar reg but it's all context dependent. I think with fMRI studies, it's even more context dependent. So yes, I get from, uh, from Russ's uh, experiments uh, with uh, risk or his experiment with words. I, I get networks as a certain variation over individuals. But if you took those same individuals and changed the task very, very largely, one would find a different network. And that different network might even involve some of the same regions. Um, yeah. Uh, so it seems to me, you know, they're, they're kind of levels. I mean, it's one thing to find a network for a person that's fairly robust, another to find a network for a group that's very robust over a very specific kind of task. It's another to find the fundamental mechanisms of mind. I mean, we're working at a fairly aggregated and therefore superficial and therefore context-dependent level. Well, I guess one question is whether there are actually different networks according to tasks or whether the different networks are 
there's just a common set of networks that are just being recruited in different amounts. So some of you are probably familiar with the paper by Steve Smith that came out in PNAS where they analyzed, what was it, of course, maybe you know, 30,000 data sets, different? Uh, it's 20 or 30,000 uh, individual Individual maps. About 1,000 papers. Yeah, 1,000 papers and looked at, did IC analysis and came up with, you know, set of networks and then took, you know, 15 people and put them in the magazine just doing nothing and came up with exactly the same networks. And the idea is maybe the brain they were is doing just, nothing. they were just doing, well, they were looking at a screen. Uh -huh. They were looking at a map. <laughs> they were, you know, I mean, they weren't doing a task, let's put it that way. There was no explicit task they were doing. And so you could make the argument that you don't need to do any more fMRI studies, right? You just, it's just that every fMRI study is just a weighting of those networks. How, uh, how big were those networks? How big were they? How big were they? The, the ones what do you mean? What do you mean, big? Uh, how many nodes? Uh, they weren't defined in terms of nodes. Uh, but they, they were, were networks, but without nodes. They're pretty distributed. But that's yeah. part of that just has to do with the way that IC, ICA is doing its decomposition, right? If you didn't. Oh, this was ICA. Yeah. Yeah, but you'd find similar networks even with a seed correlation analysis. Yeah, but, if you, analysis. but I mean, you could, you know, if you did uh, non-negative major factorization or some other way of factoring the data, you could presumably get sparse or less sparse Right. Uh, well, networks. they, they did split the, yeah, I mean, you could take the networks and divide them even more finely. They did do a finer IC analysis of that. Um, so they weren't, they weren't really networks, were they? They were, uh, they were ICA factorization. Well, I, I would big, beg to differ with that in terms of, I mean, what is a network? I mean, if you have things correlate, you know, um, it, it's, the analysis is quite similar to the causal analysis we've been doing in terms of looking at correlations. Because, I mean, the ICA, and I mean, even if you, if you get away from the ICA method, you can show the same thing with correlation analysis in so the resting state data. So I don't know what you mean by the same thing. The same, you would find the same patterns, uh, same sort of, you, you would argue that the same brain part of the brain, same parts of the brain are working together. Right. I, would, I would say that one of the issues uh, that may perhaps explain this, this finding is simply that the way you can experiment uh, with the brain in an fMRI scanner is very limited. I mean, you always have some kind of visual input, some auditory in input. You often request a motor response. So the question is whether you simply activate, common to all the tasks you're doing, some kind of operating system that is in the brain. And that is the common set of activations that you see. And when you do this over 30,000 images or image sets, as you were telling, you just see nothing but this operating system. The question is, what do we see in a specific task in addition to this operating system? Is one question. And the other question is, how much can I modulate the system by changing things in my specific task? And this learns something about how the players interact uh, with respect to so it is perhaps less interesting to say, okay, these are the six centers or so that I always see, but how do they interact with uh, when I give the brain this specific task? Well, yeah, I, I would agree with that, but I would also argue it's very interesting to ask what the brain does when you're not doing anything. <laughs> you still you still look around. You well, still have a screen. You, yeah. still, you still have the noise from the scanner and whatnot. I mean, the, the, uh, if you don't do anything, you still do anything. You still live. Right, right. But, 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 but the, <laughs> you the idea don't is a dead brain. I know, but the idea is even just things. from that, you can learn a lot about what the brain is doing. And it turns out that these fluctuations that you see in resting state data are actually there under anesthesia as well. So they're not driven by <clears throat> you sitting there thinking about things. They're right. driven by something more fundamental about how the brain is. Look, and they say that it's something about. like the operating system. Well, so wouldn't it, would it be great to know what the operating system is, right? I mean, it's like, you know, if you know what the operating system is, right. then you know how to write the software right. to work on that operating right. system. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> then, then you're in trouble. You're uh, anybody, anyone who hasn't spoken uh, would like to say something? Would you like to say something? Yeah, go ahead. About, I like to close it in about two, three minutes, to okay, be honest. Okay. Well, I just wanted to return to my question about, uh, and we've been, number one there on individual variation. Let's say that I have a, um, a beaker of alcohol, ethanol, and a beaker of water. I look at them, they look the same. And I could treat them as being the same, but we know that they are not. 
Well, depends on how you ask the question. If I'm asking about fluid dynamics, both liquids can answer certain questions. If I ask the effect they have on uh, human uh, physiology, they're very different, I mean, hugely different. If I just a priori assume that they are the same, and I ask the wrong question, I get the wrong answer. There is no way around that. If I have apples and oranges, and I'm asking questions that are not just about fruits, I get the wrong answer if I assume that they are the same. So if you have two brains, and you assume that they're the same without knowing so, you have no way of knowing whether the question you ask is the right question or not. You may get the right answer, you may not. You have no way that I know of to know which one you have. And to say it works, there are lots of examples contrary to that. I give you just one. I think, because, I think it's easy to visualize. It's the aha moment of learning. Almost all learning theory assumes some sort of statistical gradual learning. But the aha moment is, I don't get it, I don't get it, I get it, I get it. And you go from zero accuracy to 100% accuracy. But some people get the moment before others. So if you average the aha moment, you get the classical S-shaped learning curve. Meaning you get a model that works for a population but is incorrect for every single individual. Uh, I can close out with just a very simple experiment that I, I conducted recently. Looking at, at, at graphs of, of, of six indi individuals, it was very clear that three did one thing and three did another thing. Just looking at it, it was very clear. Three did one thing, three did another thing. If I averaged them, I would not know that there was these two groups. I would destroy the information. In other words, I do not see any argument for aggregating data before you know that you're talking about things that are interchangeable. You cannot assume it. What do you mean by interchangeable? Um, the, an, of, uh, of, an atom of, uh, of oxygen, and a, another atom of oxygen, when we do what we know about them, I can do the test on one atom and I can do it on another and I get the same result. But we know that your brain is not interchangeable from when you were Masses and there are different isotopes. And then you can get into that and you say, well, you gave me two uh, atoms of, of oxygen but I don't get the same result. Then, I, then we, of course, you get into the fact that atoms aren't interchangeable, they're isotopes of, of them. Here's the point. We did a lot of chemistry very successfully before we knew about isotopes, yes? And uh, similarly, we do all kinds of experimentation with, and we get correct causal conversions with uh, groups that aren't uniform or homogeneous in every respect. Uh, in fact, the whole point of modern statistics, at least from Fisher, uh, is to deal with just such inhomogeneous cases. So it seems to me that you have a point, it seems to me you're correct. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, um, it's a point only if I want to uh, know perfection. If I want to know everything about things, then yeah. Yes. No, no th this, is, this is get back to, gets back to the uh, ethanol and water. If you ask the right question, then, then those two things are, are quite comparable. If you ask a different question, say what the effect on humans are by drinking them, the two different liquids, it's the wrong question to mix them. But, the but so the, the a priori, before you do anything, you don't know wh wh which case you're, you're in. That's the problem. So that the fact we that in some cases... Years without knowing that we were asking the right question, but we pretty much figured out that what the structure, that's what Dalton and Canizaro and Avogadro were all about. And of course, how would they to know they were asking the right question? Well, are you right? Are you sure you had the right answer? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Well, Newton would have said that too before Einstein. Uh, yeah, well, that's good okay. on him. That's okay, isn't it? That's, that, I, no, that's not it's, sure. It's, like, the don't, they use Newton's equations. We still use Newton's equations in almost all space. Absolutely. The second, example, so, uh, the second example you gave of you know, three people did it this way and three people did it this way, if you average it, you didn't find it. That's okay. And then some smart guy comes along and says, you know, I should have looked at them individually. 
And you know, for, um, as a statistician, the term I always think of is exchangeability. That is, I don't want identical, I want exchangeable. I can't always judge exchangeable, which is your point, and it's well taken. But I often start with exchangeable. So I took a bunch of schizophrenics and I treated them as if they were exchangeable. And I learned X. And then it turned out they were not exchangeable because this group of first episode schizophrenics is different than this group of chronic schizophrenics. So, you know, I don't think what you're saying is counter to the kind of flow of research, really. That is, you would stop yourself at the, at the starting gate if you didn't assume exchangeability somewhere for something. Remember, I said I was going to be the judge? <laughs> I'm the judge. Uh, and what happens is uh, <laughs> court is going to be closed. You're so the, for everybody, time. everyone here, you're welcome to come tomorrow. I think it's going to be even more lively the discussion. <laughs> so uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. And for those, uh, for the. Uh, <laughs>